y'all, I'm Shannon Morris. I've been making tech tutorials on YouTube for well over a decade for a whole bunch of channels. A couple of years ago, I built my very first Plex server on a Synology NAS. It was so much fun, but since then, I have seen a need for an upgrade. My old NAS is the DS414 Slim from 2014. It's almost as old as my YouTube career. Now, while it definitely worked to get started, it is a little bit slow. It doesn't give me much in terms of CPU speed, and it's not very flexible in terms of functionality and upgrades. So it is time for me to upgrade this baby to a bigger beast that can handle everything that I throw at it. Today, we are going to go through the process of upgrading your Plex server to new hardware, how to choose a new NAS box, backing up, moving your media, and checking the new installation. Now, first off, this video is in partnership and sponsored by Plex. I have been a huge fan of Plex for many years. Not only does Plex make it easy to manage my own personal media collection, but it also works like I would expect it to. So it keeps track of watch progress in videos and it's heavily customizable so that it feels super personalized. Plex also has more than 50,000 free titles on demand and 600 live TV channels. Plus the app is available cross platform. So whether I'm accessing it on my smart TV or via my phone, I can watch movies like Train to Busan, which I highly recommend, I love that movie, or Farscape. Also, I was super stoked when I found The Last Unicorn on Plex. I may have grown up with that movie and can straight up quote it from memory. So let's go ahead and get my old Plex boy, that's my old server's name, upgraded to my new beefier setup. So the first question is, how do you choose a new NAS? Now, since I am already familiar with Synology's operating system and installing a Plex server on that hardware, I'm just gonna stick with that brand. But Synology makes a ton of different NAS boxes, so how do you choose one? Well, after doing tons of research, these are the things that I think matter most. CPU, each and every single NAS has a CPU and that CPU needs to handle lots of processing for media files. When it comes to a Plex server, you may want to consider getting a NAS that can support QuickSync for hardware transcoding with an Intel CPU. Plex has a very handy article on their site explaining how this works and it's a great reference to tell if your hardware supports it. There's also a spreadsheet that breaks down a ton of information regarding transcoding of media files and shows which NAS boxes will support hardware transcoding. Now, hardware transcoding may be a requirement and this is not included on all NASes. Hardware transcoding allows for you to use specialized hardware to convert video files from one format to another. You may need this for older devices that are streaming videos from your NAS, but lots of newer tech take care of this via software transcoding. For example, if you are storing your media in a newer codec like H.265, but the devices you're streaming to only support H.264, your server, in my case, my NAS, will need to do some transcoding. Your CPU will be able to handle a few streams using software transcoding, but if you have a busy household, then hardware transcoding might be a better option. Using hardware transcoding, which happens via your GPU and QuickSync, can free up your CPU. Next is memory. Your NAS also comes with RAM built in and sometimes space for extra sticks of RAM. So consider if upgrades are available and if the built-in amount can keep buffering and lag times to a minimum. Now look on the back of your NAS box. You should see some ports, some connectivity. Does the NAS offer USB-C or USB-A slots to transfer files? What kind of ethernet port does it have? Check the speed of the ports based on your network. For example, a NAS might come with two one gig ethernet and one 10 gig RJ45. Some NASes come with two ethernet ports allowing for protection against network interface failures. Now I won't be setting up link aggregation on my own server, which would give me faster performance if multiple devices are accessing data on the same network at the same time. Since I don't currently need this for my two person household, that's not a determining factor for me, but it may be for you. Scalability is also important if you expect that you may need more storage in the future. Now, some NAS boxes allow you to add an expansion unit to easily add more storage without having to buy a new NAS. How many drive bays are available? For me, 
two is fine, but I went with one that has four. I always need at least two so that I can do a raid setup. Some raids need three drives to perform. I usually just use a raid one, which mirrors the data across two drives. This time I went with a raid five, so it's slightly different, but I still need multiple drives to make that happen. In either case, this means that if one drive fails, I have a second copy of all of my data and I can just replace the failed drive. Now, lastly, of course, is cost. A NAS box can get kind of pricey. So seriously weigh the pros and cons of each one that checks all those boxes to determine if you can save some money anywhere. With storage getting less expensive, you may find it beneficial to buy a two bay NAS instead of a four bay or buy the one with less RAM, but with upgradable slots. Next is choosing your hard drives. And this comes down to a few important factors. NAS dedicated drives are rated for continuous use and they will last longer than your regular consumer PC drives. The PC drive that I have installed in my gaming tower is not being accessed 24 seven, but a NAS drive will be reading and writing at a much greater scale. So stick to NAS rated drives. RPM and cache is important. A 7200 RPM drive means the disk is literally spinning faster, so you will get faster performance than on a 5400 RPM drive. 5400 RPM drives can be more efficient though, so look at the quality of the drives and compare lifetimes and warranties as well. Now, if your NAS has space for an SSD cache drive, then you can use SSD caching for memory dependent tasks like file sharing. Storage size is a definite must. Consider how much space you will need for several years down the line. If you are using a RAID, you will also need to consider how much storage you actually need because the amount that you buy might be halved because of that mirroring. Cost is also a factor. Drives have dropped in price compared to a few years ago, but you will find that as you dip into the higher terabytes, the price difference is going to be a little minimal. No matter what hardware you choose, it'll work great with Plex Media Server and the entire ecosystem of Plex client applications. And this can even be enhanced with Plex Pass. So Plex Pass is Plex's special subscription tier that gives you a DVR functionality for over the air or OTA broadcasts, mobile downloads, hardware transcoding, bonus content that you can enjoy like movies and TV show extras, and my personal favorite, highly detailed data about your server's config and your status. I've had a Plex Pass for about four years now, and I use the included features daily. Now, since I have already set up a Synology Plex server on my channel before, I'm gonna fly through the first part of this. I have already got my new NAS set up on my network. I've installed the Synology DSM operating system. I already enabled a RAID for data mirroring or parity. Now let's back up the old media server data and the server files. Now, while this is not necessary, I absolutely think that you should do this in case of any issues. You don't want to lose your data. I say all the time that two is one, one is none. So make sure that you have at least two copies of your files. Plex has a deal going on with Backblaze until March of next year. So Backblaze is a great option for cloud storage and backing up your media files. If you do have a large library, you may wanna consider a zip or a tar file to speed up the process. This can take a really long time. So start this process early and just do something else while it's working. Now, since we are using a NAS, you will notice this preferences.xml file in the main Plex Media Server or the PMS directory. This has all of your corresponding settings included in it. So make sure to back that up too. Now, where do you find all of the data? Well, there's a whole support page dedicated to different operating systems, but this is where I will find it on a Synology NAS. If I'm using DSM-7, this would be under Volume 1, Plex Media Server, App Data, Plex Media Server. On DSM-6, which is the old one that I used, it would be under Volume 1, Plex Library, Application Support, Plex Media Server. Make sure not to save your zip file in the main PMS data folder as the media server could delete this without you knowing. Store it somewhere else, like on your PC, till you are ready to reinstall the data on your new server. Now to start moving your files to the new server, start out on your old NAS. In the Plex Media Server settings, disable the option to empty trash automatically after every scan. On the new NAS, go ahead and install the Plex Media Server DSM app. It's located in the package center, update it and set it up. Now I highly recommend just duplicating the server name, 
for your new Plex setup to keep the workload to a minimum. You can also duplicate the drive name, the file structure, and the metadata. Now in the Plex web app over in your browser, sign out of your account by going to settings, server, and general, and then quit and exit the Plex media server. Now you can start getting server data on the new system. You will need to replace any existing files or subdirectories from the installation with your own data. If you zipped your data, expand, then place it in the new NAS. Make sure the Plex Media Server system internal user is set to read write permissions access for each directory, and then you can reboot. Now all of your data should be in place on the new NAS. If you launch the Plex web app, you will see your libraries, but chances are your content will not work yet, and that is totally normal. The content location needs to be relinked, so edit one of your libraries and add the new folder location. You could still see your previous folder location, but just leave it there for now. Do this for each library, one by one, and then once all the libraries have been relinked, you can click Scan Library Files if it doesn't automatically start on its own. Now this may take a while as well, but once everything is scanned and updated, verify that things are looking good, you can go in and try playing a couple of your videos, and your content works. If all looks well, you can click Edit and remove the old folder locations from your libraries, and finally, we are moving on to a few little bits of cleanup. Make sure to re-enable empty trash automatically after every scan. Empty the trash for your server. Clean up any bundles for the server. You will need to give this setting time to complete. And then optimize your database. You will find that you will also need to re-enable remote access and any forwarded ports on your router if you had this enabled previously. And it is official. You are done. Now you can access your Plex Media Server, which is brand new and updated on your new network attached storage device from any of your smart devices, be it your phone or your TV or wherever. I have already been testing mine with a few different video files and it is so much faster than my old NAS box. It's definitely something that I probably should have upgraded a long time ago, so it was definitely time. Let me know if you have any questions down below. Now that I have gone through this setup process a couple of times, I can definitely answer your questions. Thank you so much for watching and subscribing as well. My name's Shannon Morse. I'll see you next time. Bye y'all.